launch. Um, Julie is our trainer and assessor and she actually wrote the course. So a fantastic person to take you through it all. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please message us using the chat. And towards the end of this webinar, we will have a question and answer session where we'll go through any of your questions. But please just, just write it in the chat as we go and we'll, we'll look at it at the end. So without further ado, thank you very much, Julie. Over to you. Thanks, Libby. Evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Julie Hegmottom, as I've just been introduced. And yes, aside from writing the course and being a tutor um, with the London School of Childcare Studies, I work as a sleep consultant currently, for those of you that don't know me. I've been working as a maternity nurse and sleep consultant for around 30 years, um, still learning, and that's one of the things we'll touch on as we go through this presentation. As Libby said, any questions you've got, please just forward them to us and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the hour. So, first of all, let's look at where we're going to. So this evening, we're gonna look at a number of different areas. So we're gonna look at the role of the sleep practitioner and actually what that means. What do we do? What, what are our responsibilities when supporting clients? We're gonna talk about why there's a growing need for sleep practitioners. So the, the kind of the profession has really grown um, and it's become much more considerable now. We're going to look at why that's happening. We're going to look at some of the challenges that you might experience with the role and then how you can support parents when you're working with them. We're going to look at how to gain experience when you're starting out and we're really, really excited about our work experience programme. So we're going to kind of touch on that and how that will help you in your role. We're going to look at just touching on writing effective sleep plans. Everybody does them differently. And we're going to look at the main core parts of that that should be in your plan. As we said, we're going to introduce you to the sleep practitioner course and how it can benefit you. And then we'll have our question and answer session at the end. So really hope you gain what you need want to gain from this course um, and from this webinar tonight. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the role of the sleep practitioner. So a lot of the time people kind of say, well, the role is clear. It's obviously to help children get to sleep. But whilst that obviously is an aspect and, and why we're there and why we're being asked to go in and support parents, actually the role is much bigger than that. And to actually understand how to approach each client as you go in is really, really important. So I want you to be thinking about how you would support and guide. It's about mentoring parents. It's about analysing the situation. So when we're supporting, we need to look at each client as an individual. Everyone needs something a bit different. So, for example, how each of you would like to be supported, maybe in a situation that you're finding challenging, will be different from somebody else. And that's exactly the same from the clients that we're working with. We all like to receive support in different ways. So some of us learn better by having things written down. Other people prefer face to face. Other people need a lot more sensitivity in looking at changes and how to move forward. So as a sleep practitioner, you need to learn to be very flexible. And it's that flexible temperament and personality of yourselves that's really going to help you being able to guide parents. When we talk about being a mentor, what do we actually mean? Well, again, we'll look at this a bit closely later, but different people in this profession will view their roles differently. So what one person will do may be different from another. So for me, it's about being there to support parents and help them grow in confidence. So it's absolutely fine that we could go in and sort out a sleep problem. But actually what we need to be thinking about is what happens when you're not there. And whilst, yes, you may resolve the situation by doing several nights or a couple of weeks with the family, at some point you're still going to hand over to those parents. And it's not always going to be plain sailing. Children are not consistent like that. And so what you might achieve when you're there, you need to be thinking very much about how that actually works and is interpreted as you move forward. So I very much see our role as a mentor, that that's ongoing support 
in a way which you don't need to have regular contact with that client, but that you're leaving them in a situation where they know how to take things forward. Why do we need to do it this way? Well, parents are very overwhelmed nowadays and are not sure kind of what the right and wrong thing is to do. So again, for me, it's about analyzing the situation with the parents. So understanding why the issue exists but looking at the bigger picture. And again, I'll keep coming back to that this evening. For me, that's what it's about. It's about looking at the bigger picture. So you do need to be able to analyze and assess the situation in order to be able to give parents a plan and ideas for moving forward. The next point about being flexible according to the needs and values of the parents. So I've just touched on that in the first point. So everybody that you, come in contact with and every client that wants to work with you are going to have different needs. They're also going to have different values. So I speak a lot when I'm delivering courses about what are our own core values and a core value is what you believe to be true. And that is going to again differ according to your culture, your experience, your upbringing and also just your personal self. And that is the same for parents. It might sound very common sense, but that is allowing you to work individually with the clients that you're supporting, to listen to them, to find out what is it they want to achieve. How realistic is that? And again, the kind of parents, the parent type that they are. So are they parents that actually need a very structured routine? And on the course, we would talk about how to manage that. Or are they parents that need much more of a flexible routine? Maybe because of their core values, but also because of their parenting lifestyle and their family lifestyle. So again, are you able to be flexible? So we can teach you that, but you do need to have that underlying kind of ability to be flexible in different situations. The next thing we come up with quite a lot of confusion now is why are there different titles for the same profession? Again, very personal. So we're using the term sleep practitioner here. Other people will use the term sleep trainer. The reason that's really not on this part is because I don't personally use that term. I, again, because of my own core values and the way that I work, I don't see us as needing to train anyone. I think it's about supporting people and guiding. So I actually use the words a lot, sleep consultant or sleep support. Again, when you're using the term consultant, we have to be very careful because consultant means for most people, somebody in the medical profession. And that obviously isn't us. We're non-medical based, you know, unless you've got a, a, a qualification where you're a doctor, GP, health visitor, and you can use that terminology in as you promote your work. We need to keep things simple and be very transparent about who it is we are and what is it we offer. So if you choose to use the word consultant, just be clear to parents what that means for you. Okay. Um, like I said, other people use the word sleep trainer, sleep practitioner, lots of different names, but don't, be, don't worry about that. You will find what fits comfortably with you as you start moving forward. So when we're looking at the role again, we need to be there to provide a clear way forward. And this is where your sleep plans come in and the consultation process. So when you're doing the consultations, and we'll look at different ways of doing that in a moment, but you are there to provide a clear way forward for these parents. So whatever aim and objective you've set out with them, it needs to be clear that progressive route in how they're going to get to there. And again, different people like things done in different ways. So you need to be thinking, do I have the same sleep plan for everyone as in the same layout or do I vary it? Again, you've got to be careful because you need to make sure everybody gets the same service. But the way that's interpreted may be different. So if I'm working with clients, for example, where English is not a first language or they find English quite difficult to read, so maybe they're dyslexic, then you need to be thinking about how to provide that information in a way that is accessible for them. 
um, you don't want to be turning clients away just because of their individual need and personal um, additional needs. So we'll look at what that means when we come on to the sleep plans. You need to think about what the difference is between the different roles. So a night nanny and maternity nurse is very different from a sleep practitioner. So a night nanny is caring for the babies or the children at night so the parents can get a rest. So that's one thing. You might, as a night nanny, have already had experience in that role, and that's why you want to move into being a sleep practitioner. But you're not there necessarily to solve issues. You might be there to give some advice, but you're not necessarily going to be expected to sort everything out. As a maternity nurse, you're there to support the parents, definitely, in establishing a routine and a pattern that works for them, and being very hands-on with the baby and um, the mother or, and the father or the partner but again there is a difference in the terms of sleep practitioner is a very short-term job normally you wouldn't normally be working with this family for any particular length of time other than what is laid out in your package so you're in there you might be working with several clients at once which again a night nanny maternity nurse maybe work with one or two families at a time unlikely to be more than that so you are having to adapt and move on and be able to kind of adapt to the different clients you've got running at any one time, which is really exciting. It's really challenging, but it's exciting. It's a brilliant role to take on. You need to be thinking about identifying the packages that are going to meet the needs of your clients. So again, you might go, well, what's, what, how does this link in with what the role of the sleep practitioner is? Well, unless you kind of have a clear understanding of what it is you're offering, the parents aren't going to know. So it's really important that you're very clear about the services that you offer. So when we're thinking about that, everybody again can work very differently. So there are some sleep practitioners that will go into the home working overnight and will support and guide the parents through the new changes that you are recommending. So personally, I used to do that quite a lot. I now very rarely do an overnight. Um, one, because I think I'm getting too old um, to be sitting on the bedroom floor all night. Um, but two, I, I don't particularly want to move into that anymore. But for you, it's a great way of really getting involved and seeing what's happening. I've always really loved doing overnights because you can see um, changes quite quickly and you can assess much clearer in the fact you're right in front of the situation as it arises. So it's a really good way of getting some experience in that and really showing the parents that you're on their side, that you're trying to help them. Another way of doing it is by doing a home visit. So this might take place in the day or the evening. I still do these. So for myself, for example, they're three hour visits where they have a longer consultation period than they would if they took out one of my telephone packages. But again, not everybody wants to do home visits. It might depend where you live or where you're working from. So I know people that maybe work overseas, but then do some evenings working as a sleep practitioner. So again, they can't go into people's homes. I've worked with sleep practitioners that really don't want to go into people's homes. They want to keep it all more remotely. So it doesn't matter. It's about thinking, what is it I want to bring? What is it that I actually want to do? Because it's, it's completely open. And that's one of the wonderful things about this position is that you can make it fit in with what you, one, you enjoy, two, where you feel your skills and your attributes lay, um, and three, you adapt it to make it your business um, in the way that you want it delivered um, and that you want to support. So it's, it's a great job for that. So in terms of your going back to the home visits, it's about thinking, what would you like to achieve in that time? And the course is going to help you with those packages. It's going to help you understand the different opportunities and different options available to you. The other way, which is very common, is telephone packages. So myself personally, I offer two, four and six week packages. And I usually draw parents to starting with the two week package. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, surely we want them to take out the bigger packages. That's all well and good. But actually, if you say to parents, 
we would expect to make some really significant progress in the two weeks. And then if you want to move into four weeks, you can absolutely do that. It kind of just shows that you're on their side. You're not just taking the money and wanting it to be a long process and last as long as possible. It's not about that, this job. It's about helping parents through a really difficult, stressful time and helping them to achieve what they want to achieve within an appropriate time scale. And again, that time scale will depend very much on your philosophy and your way of working. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit. So in terms of kind of how you um, establish your role, I believe it's very much based on your personality and your temperament and your attitude, your approach to work and your philosophy behind sleep. So if we break that down on the course, we'd be looking at more gradual methods, which are the ones that I provide. So for me, I, I use what we call gentle attachment style approaches. I don't like putting things in boxes, but to help people understand, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And then you'll have other practitioners where they are doing more kind of control crying and cry out techniques, which is another box. And you then have those people that might be in the middle and might say, well, actually, do you know what? I can support in any way. I don't mind which approach I use as long as the parent's comfortable with using it. So is there a right or wrong way? No, I don't believe there is. I think there is a lot of information that's in, out there um, that kind of tries to lead you towards one or the other. And I think it's really important when you're doing this job. Personally, this is just a personal opinion, that it's about just taking a step back and going, who am I? What would I expect to happen if these were my children? Would I use this approach with my children? Would I want this done to me? So for me, there isn't a right or wrong. There's not actually been enough studies done to find out the real impact, whether it's negative and positive about gentle stars in the same way there's not been enough research done to know whether controlled crying really does have any negative detrimental effects. They're, they're very small studies that have been done. So I would say, take a step back and just work out where you're comfortable. So I hope that makes sense because I don't get your questions. So if you're asking any questions, we, I will come back to it. So I hope that's sort of been a bit helpful in just looking at that. So let's move on to the, the challenge of the role and in supporting parents. So we need to be available. And again, this will vary according to the packages that you're offering. So one of the things that you need to be thinking about is when you're offering a consultation, is that going to have limited support to it? So you might do two weeks of follow-up support, but what does that look like? Where is your availability? So when you're trying to develop this business and, and make yourself available to work with clients in this way, you do need to think, are you somebody that is completely flexible and available? You could work evenings, weekends, daytime, early mornings, whenever. And if that's the case, then with your following support, is that going to still be the case? Or maybe you're somebody that does have a day job or you have your own children and therefore you can only work evenings. So it's really important that your clients know when you're going to be available and how quick they can expect a response if they ask you a question. So just to give you an idea, I offer unlimited text and email support for the period that they're working with me. So for example, if they're just having a troubleshooting call, which is just an hour call with no ongoing support, I don't have to be available other than that main consultation and I need to have enough time to write their plan up. So I hope that makes sense. Um, but my other clients that have got maybe my two week or my four week package if they've done home or overnight visits, when I say unlimited, it doesn't mean I'm always there. It means if I happen to see the message come in, then I'm likely to respond pretty quick. But I do say that there's a 24 hour period in which I'm able to return their calls. So you do remember to have a life. This shouldn't just be 24 hours, which it can feel like sometimes. So it's really important to manage your time. You need to be really patient. 
So it can be at times quite frustrating and challenging because maybe you've made suggestions and now the parents are saying, it doesn't work, it's not working quick enough, what's happening? So you need to be able to be in a position where you can kind of just take a breath yourself and then go back to going, which parts of the sleep plan are you following? And sometimes parents will come back and go, we decided not to follow it. And then it's about just having that firmness, but also sensitivity to go, then that is the reason that it might not be working because you haven't made the changes yet. But you need to be able to be patient enough to be able to do that. You can scream when, they, when you put the phone down sometimes, but in that moment, it is about being patient. And it's just about reflecting on where that parent's head is, where they are in that moment. And they're going to be finding it difficult and they're probably going to feel like they're failing. And you can get quite um, a lot of negativity from parents in terms of their own self-esteem. And so for me, this is a really fantastic part of the job that I can look at giving parents confidence and making them feel better about themselves and hopefully feel that they can be a really good parent and that they are a good parent. They're just learning. And so for me, that, that is one of the wonderful things about this job. As I say, going on to that, which is kind of what I've just talked about, you may be supporting met parents who might be unclear about the goals. So again, if you need to revisit them and clarify, always make that really clear that that's no problem. I usually put it in a way that says, sometimes I write the sleep plans and they might not be clear to you. They might need more clarification because I can waffle a lot as hopefully you don't feel I'm doing tonight. Um, but you know, so I can be quite wordy. So I will often say to the parents, make sure you understand this. It's not your, um, it's not because you haven't interpreted it correctly. It's probably because I haven't written it clearly enough. And that just means you're kind of taking responsibility rather than parents feeling anxious about coming back to you and saying they don't understand something. You need to be thinking about how to implement sleep approaches with clients who are already exhausted. They're already not in a great place. And again, the course will teach you a number of different approaches that you can use with your clients. It's the basis, it's the starting point. We go through some of the main um, approaches but there's others and you will find you combine approaches yourself over time and you'll use a bit of this approach and a bit of that approach and you'll just become more comfortable with finding what those look like. You need to again be empathetic towards the parents thinking about yourself when you're absolutely exhausted how easy is it to learn something new. It's incredibly difficult and so again, that's where your patience comes in and breaking it down to clients if they need that happening. Your communication needs to be good. So again, sometimes you're working very virtual and remotely like we're doing tonight. And sometimes that makes communication quite difficult because there might be you, some of you out there that are absolutely burning to ask a question or you're thinking, I don't quite understand that and you can't let me know that. And that can be really difficult. And just as we're going to do tonight, you know, any questions you have, even if we don't get chance and time to answer them all tonight, we will always come back to you. And that's part of the school that we really want to promote is the fact that we are there for you, that we are there to mentor you, we are there to support you, not just through the course, but we want to be able to do that for you afterwards as well. Because when you're learning something new, it can be difficult. We don't just learn it straight away. So that's exactly the same for our clients. So we do need to be communicating appropriately. We need to be honest with clients. So if we feel they're not implementing something, we need to find out the reasons for why to see if we can give some alternatives, see if we can help them. But sometimes you do have to say, look, let's just look at one step at a time here and be honest with me about whether you've implemented it or whether you haven't, and it doesn't matter either way. So you need to be honest, but you want to encourage them to be honest and not feel like you're going to tell them off. I have clients where they say to me, you're not going to tell me off, are you? And I was like, of course we're not. We're working together as a team here. And that's where I really see your role. You're not just going in and doing something. You're working as part of a team, even though it might be short term. 
So why is there a growing need for sleep practitioners? Well, we have a situation now where we've moved away where families are often working and living in an area where maybe they've had to move away from their family. So maybe previous, they would have been able to have relied on support, positive support from their family or the community. That's not the case now and often families feel very isolated looking for somebody to give them some positive support. It can be very overwhelming with all the information that's out there. I'm sure we've all been in a position where we've desperately wanted to know something and we keep Googling it to try and find the right answer. And when we don't find the right answer that we're looking for, we'll Google it again. And that's exactly what parents are doing. They're Googling everything and they would have read every book. By the time they asked for help from you, they would have read every book. They would have tried every approach. They would have looked up every website that they possibly could look and I often say right can you now forget all that we might be revisiting some of those things but your child can't read that's what I always say to my parents your baby your child is clever but they can't read yet unless we're working with a much older child and therefore they don't know what they're meant to be doing what the books tell them to do they're not all textbook babies fortunately I love it because we're not all robots they're individuals and so we have to kind of bring it back and go, right, let's just look at your family. What's right for your family might not be somebody else's. And all families that come to you will feel that they're the only one in this situation. They will probably be in a situation where they're going, but all my NCT friends, all their babies are sleeping through. And that probably isn't the case. I last year worked with about five families all from the NCT group that they all went to together and not one of them shared that they were having problems. They all said their children were sleeping through the night. And so there is that real pressure to conform. And what do we mean by that anyway, sleeping through the night? What does it mean? So again, the course will help you understand that. There can be unrealistic cultural expectations. So some cultures very much celebrate having the family round late at night and children up all night or up till very late and again that might not be realistic in establishing a, a good sleep pattern and routine and so with respecting you have to work out together what is appropriate and what can be expected and again i would say it's not just about ethnic cultures we we have cultures within cultures so just because I'm white British does not mean I follow and had the same upbringing as every white British family. I hope not. Um, and, you know, we all have our own values, our own beliefs. So that makes up our own culture as well. And sometimes expectations can just be completely unrealistic. And again, it's about being honest with our clients about those. Another growing need for sleep practitioners is because we know that early intervention when there's problems improves outcomes. When you deal and you support a family when they've got a young baby or child, if you can really get that progress moving forward, and if you can really help that parent's self-esteem, they are going to enjoy being parents. They're going to thrive on it. They're going to feel confident in their role. And again, you know, there's not many jobs where you can say that, you know, and, and again, that's why I love this job, because we know we can make a real difference to the lives of these families. And we also on the course will look at the effects of sleep deprivation. And that's why we need sleep practitioners that are there to support families. Sleep deprivation is dangerous. It's just like all of us. If we haven't had enough sleep, we can't function. You know, physically we become unwell, we become more stressed, we can't think. Emotionally we become very unstable. And the less sleep you get, the less sleep you can then get moving forward. It just becomes such a cycle. And the same for these babies and children. You know, often they're not reaching their full potential because they're just too exhausted to do that. And so again, we can help you learn how to deal with that and understanding the effects. So I've had parents where they've literally driven around all night. I worked with a client last year where might be near before actually where mum would drive around from 7 p.m till midnight drive home leave the engine running dad would jump in and do the 12 to 7 a.m shift driving round and round and round and it wasn't until they had a car accident that they actually realized how ridiculous 
And the same day they had a car accident, dad was made redundant because he wasn't doing his job properly. Um, you know, and, and that's the reality of it. Okay, it's an extreme reality, but I get a lot of stories very similar to that. So we need people who are really passionate about this job to really help parents to get back their sleep, to get back their lives, and just enjoy being parents. Now I'm just going to check my watch so I know that I'm because I know that I can talk and it just goes too quick. Um, so one of the other things that we're obviously learning on the course is about how to write effective sleep plans. Now with everything, I believe there is different ways of doing this and ways that will work better for you than maybe they would work for me. So it doesn't have to be the same. It just has to work for you. And the whole purpose of sleep plans is being able to monitor and support the family through the time you're working with them. So on the course, we go through how to write sleep plans. You get examples of sleep plans that I've written. So you can actually see the process. But like I said, it does, you can use it as a template, but it doesn't have to be fixed. You can adapt it according to what you would like it to look like. Um, and in accordance with the kind of approaches that you're using. But they do need to show how you're going to support that family. So you need to be very clear again about the package they're getting. So when I write a sleep plan at the top, it will always give a bit of information about the family. Now, when you're writing sleep plans now, you must ensure you only use initials. And this is because of the changes in the way we pass information through. So again, just be mindful of that. Um, so you, I always start with what are the family's aims and what package have they got and what is achievable in the time that we're going to be working with. And I am forever adapting my sleep plans. So on the course, one of the main assignments is to write several sleep plans. And some people that have been on our courses previous, they've used real examples of families they've worked with. Obviously, not divulging who they are, but they've used it from direct experience. Other people on the course have not had any experience. So they will either ask friends and families for suggestions and kind of do it that way in sort of role play. Or other people, you can make them up. It doesn't matter. You can make the family up and the issues that they're facing. So it really doesn't matter. And like I say, it doesn't matter if you're new into this role or you've been doing it a while. There's always things to learn. And for those of you that are just looking at starting, we all started somewhere. And it's, like I said, it's an exciting profession to be in. When you're doing your sleep plans, you always need to say how the changes will be implemented. And I believe not just what those changes are, but I believe very much why. So it's much easier to bring about change if you understand why you're doing it. Um, so one of the things I always look at in quite a lot of detail is diet, because diet plays such a huge part in sleep, particularly nowadays. So I won't just say, OK, improve the diet. I'll say um, I'd like you to look at reducing the amount of fruit your child's having. Um, and if you want to know why, we'll, we'll do another webinar. You can ask me that another time. Um, but fruit intake is quite a big thing now. Um, and so looking at that element of it, but not just what, why. And it's just literally to give you a little bit of a, an insight into that is to do with the sugars in fruit. And they still can cause quite a lot of sugar spikes for young children. So it's about understanding that. You need to identify those clear aims and goals. And you need to recognise that according to different age and development differences, it's going to mean you have to use different sleep approaches. So it's no good just thinking, well, if I learn one approach, I can use that in all situations because it's not going to work. So again, the course will help you through that. Now, we're, we've got something really exciting that we're bringing in now, and that's kind of more mentoring and work experience opportunities. And this can be fantastic if maybe you haven't worked in this sector before. So what we do here with the school is that we look very much about lifelong learning and that you never learn everything. You never know enough. You're always having to research and look at your gaps in your own learning and then how you can actually work to improve that. So we want to be thinking about where our learning gaps are, but also what are we going to do to actually fill those in and achieve those? 
So our work experience program will just give you an opportunity to be mentored, to actually find jobs, um, which would be on our website, that you can think, yeah, I, I'd actually be really interested in that. And actually getting mentored and support whilst you're in that work experience program. And there will be things that we ask you to do. Now, you might decide that you don't necessarily looking for a paid job to do that. It might literally be like a college placement. And again, that's, that's where I started doing free work just to get my name known, to get my experience and also that client that you're doing your work experience with, yes, it won't be the best paid job in the world, but if you can get a reference from them to show them what you've done and to work through the criteria that we lay out, it's gonna be a fantastic opportunity for you to really move into this sort of work profession. Um, we're using a mentorship approach, so you don't feel you've just done the course and we say goodbye and that's it. We want you to feel mentored. We want you to feel that there's opportunities for you in moving forward in your own studies. And there's lots of exciting things happening with that. Um, we, we've got a Facebook group that you can actually get support from, from other people also in the role, not just ourselves. You know, everybody brings their own experience and knowledge and skills. And we want to be able to provide a platform that you can share that with. So again, I hope that makes sense. Um, in terms of the sleep practitioners course, like I said, it's about starting your career. It's about being in a profession that's exciting, it's challenging, and to be honest, you learn a lot about yourself. And I think that's part of the work experience program as well, that you're actually developing your own confidence, just as you're doing with the parents, we want to help you do that. So to actually develop confidence in the career, because if you haven't done it before, it can be quite frightening. You know, you're working on your own. And there's not necessarily a lot of support. You can feel quite isolated. And what we're trying to do at the London School is actually bring all that together and say, you know, we're here for you. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. And we're here for you to develop your career. And we want to be a part of that. We want you to be able to understand a range of approaches. So when you're going into those roles, maybe initially and you're not sure, you've got a starting point. You've got something that you think, yeah, do you know what? The gradual retreat program, that sits really nicely with me and my philosophy. Or if I do a controlled crying approach, yeah, I understand that. I can adapt that. So it just gives you that opportunity to really think about who you are and what you want to practice. You'll learn about being aware of healthy sleep practices. So we use the term healthy sleep to kind of move away from it just being you do ABC, healthy sleep practices and associations. Look at really positive ways of helping sleep, which aren't all about the actual changing of what happens in the night, for example. So it looks at environment. It looks at food at eating, it looks at weight, it looks at any additional needs that there might be in, it looks at sleep props, it, it just looks at a lot more than actually the sleep itself, all these factors and again one of the assignments we ask you to do is about linking diet and exercise together with sleep, so again you'll be thinking about those links. We'll be looking at giving you confidence and help in writing those initial sleep plans. There's a lot of sleep plans to write for the assignments for this course, but they're only there to help give you that confidence and ability to practice and learn what should go in the sleep plan. And then when I assess those, I will always give you some feedback on, you know, even if they're excellent, I will always say to you, you, have, you could think about this or maybe think about that if I think that they haven't got enough information in, I can help you with that. So again, we will give you that opportunity to learn how to write sleep plans that are manageable, because they can take time, and a lot of people think it's something that can be done very quickly, whereas it's not, it's the whole part of your package. You need to be able to understand sleep patterns and the physiology of sleep. So again, we look at that on the course, and you need to be thinking, we want you to bring credibility to your role. We want you to be excellent sleep practitioners. We don't want you to just be another sleep practitioner. We want you to get more from it than that. 
So that kind of, you might be glad to hear, brings me kind of to the end of what I've got to say. Um, now, I've got a few questions that um, somebody asked me to put towards this evening. So I don't know if Libby, you've got hundreds of questions, in which case I can go to you first in your questions. We have, we have one question so far. Okay. Um, and that's from Caroline. And uh, it says, how do you approach families who use sleep environments that are against advice like rock and play, um, sleepy heads, sleeping in bounces at night and etc.? OK, so that's quite a big question. <laughs> so um, in terms of things like rocking, um, parents have rocked their babies to sleep. It's not a bad thing. It's not and unsafe unless the parents are falling asleep doing it. But rocking is a way of helping babies to settle. The problem comes when they get to the point where actually they won't settle as soon as you transfer, they're awake again. So it's a problem rather than a safety issue mainly. Um, but again, it's about finding an approach where you can gradually step back from that rocking. So I hope that kind of makes sense for that one. Now, in terms of unsafe safe sleep practices, so you mentioned a few with that question, Caroline. So sleeping all night in bouncers. So one, that is not safe, and it would go against the advice of safe, safe sleeping. So you would need to make that very clear to parents that that is not in line with safe sleep. And you have to do it in a sensitive way. Um, hopefully they're asking for your advice because they want to move away from that, in which case you can say, get rid of the bouncer straight away. Um, I had a client recently that I've just stopped working with who bounced on the ball all night, bounced on a yoga ball all night, her and her husband took it in turns. So the first night and the conversation said the ball's going, it, it's gone because it's not safe. So if I'm going to support you, we need to get rid of it straight away. But this is what I'd like you to do. So you kind of have to rush in with that bit a little bit. Um, so anything that is not following SIDS guidance through the Lullaby Trust, and if you don't know them, they're well worth looking up. They've got a website. They're the leading organisation on giving advice to the government. Um, and so any practices which don't fall in line with that, you need to not support. Okay, so you have to be very clear in that. Um, now, sleepy heads are a bit different. And this is where there's a line that's crossed. So if you ask the Lullaby Trust, can we support sleep changes using a sleepy head? They will not give you a definitive answer because there's one, not been enough studies done on it. They would say no in a way um, because I've spoken to them on this and they would say it isn't in line with their sleep practices guidance. However, if you use it with a baby that doesn't yet roll and they're put to sleep on their back in there, there is unlikely to be any problems, but it's how you want to support that. I'm comfortable supporting families that still use sleepy heads, but once that child shows the baby shows signs they're going to roll, I say they have to go. Same with cot bumpers. Um, now, it's again a bit trickier when you're doing virtual remote work because you don't actually know what they're actually doing. So what I do in my sleep plans is I give them some information on safe sleeping. And I say, these are my recommendations and I would ask that you follow these. Um, but if they choose not to, if they don't tell you, then there's nothing you can do about that. You just have to make sure you keep returning to that guidance. If you're doing an overnight, then you have to follow that guidance for um, your insurance purposes. So if I'm doing an overnight, I will make it very clear beforehand that they need to remove any cot bumpers, the mattress needs to be suitable for the cot, that we need to have a safe sleeping space, wherever that may be. If we're gonna do co-sleeping, I go through the safe practices for co-sleeping. And again, on the course, you will learn that. But if you want something to do it yourself too straight away, the Lullaby Trust is, is a really good way to go. So I hope, Caroline, that's answered your question. Yeah, and Caroline did mention afterwards, um, that, uh, she was talking about the machines as well that, that rock in the US, apparently. Yeah, um, the rocking machines um, are a nightmare. Um, 
you again unless the baby has got a medical condition where it's been advised and that actually caroline's the same with the bouncers if you've had a pediatrician's letter that states clearly and you do ask for evidence of this that they are using this for health reasons so for example babies that have got GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease um, they may be asked to sleep in more of an upright position using certain props. Um, I always say, could you please get that written down for me by the paediatrician or consultant they're working with? So I've got that for, to cover me, really. And so I know how I'm supporting the family. So that can be a situation where those sorts of information, certain items are used. There are some wacky ones out there, though. Um, and I usually say for naps with the young baby, as long as their airway is clear, it's up to the parents. But again, I will always go back to that safe sleeping and for safe sleeping. Babies should be lying flat on their back with their toes touching the base of the cot with no blankets or if they're using blankets, no further up than the chest and monitoring temperature of the room and things like white noise and that there's, you know, I don't actually believe they make that much difference unless they are trying to knock out background noise. Um, but they're not going to be of a problem to the family as long as they're running all night. Um, now, there is a machine um, that you may have seen, Caroline, since you're asking this question, which is like a big egg. And it's got a remote control on the front and that opens the door with a very strange noise. And the baby goes in there and they can be strapped in and then the door closes and they have music playing and lights flashing. Um, if I see one of those, I tell them to put it on eBay because they're not safe. The baby can't be monitored and there's too much stimulation. So if you've ever come up with one of those, get them to sell it or ask them to sell it, put it away while they're working with you. So I hope that helps. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, okay. So one of them is, is the course um, OCN? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's um, OCN, for those of you that don't know, know are an external awarding body. Um, and we've gone through them to ensure the course is up to the standard of a level three, which is what we're offering. Now, the level three means basically the same level as a kind of an A level standard of knowledge and learning. Um, but yes, so we've gone through the accreditation process and we use them as our external examination board. Brilliant. And also, um, how will the course be delivered, for example, webinars or held in London? So at the moment, it, it's held in London, but I believe you can also do it online. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just checking. Um, so you can do it as an online course or you can do it face to face in the classroom. It's one weekend. We also um, have webinars following the weekend. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, which will go into detail to help you with your assessments. So yeah. Support with that. And that's something that's new that we've, we've brought in now. So again, really exciting times for us in changing that. Um, and then we have another question um, from Galaxy. Um, hi, I'd like to know how parents react to no home visits. If there is no face-to-face -face contact, what is the ratio of parent, parents who prefer this way? I feel like most of the people prefer home visits and then may phone calls, email support. I'm just curious about this, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it depends on your own way of working. So I used to do more, a higher percentage of home visits overnight day visits most of my work now is telephone consultations i have to be honest when i started out i would have i would have done home visits most times because i needed to get to know different styles i needed to get to know different children's responses to things and whilst they're all different there is certain areas that you find will come up time and time again so it depends how you're going to do it i mean i work with clients all over the world so i, I couldn't actually do home visits to all of them although i have in the past worked overseas doing that but i don't anymore and so when i'm doing that i quite like skype I do use Skype quite a lot now because you get that face-to-face -face interaction and get to know each other without having to go in. 
Um, I think home visits and overnights bring a lot of benefits in the fact you can get to know those parents a little bit more. You get to see the environment and to a degree, particularly if you're doing an overnight, can support them in making the changes. Do I believe them to be essential? No, I don't. Um, do I have a higher success rate with those that have home visits over telephone? No, I don't. But that's now, and I, I honestly can't remember, but I'm pretty, I've only ever in my career had a few families where what I suggested didn't work. So, and two of them were home visits, you know, and it was more that they just decided they weren't ready for the changes. So I don't think it matters as long as you adapt your practices accordingly, but I believe there are real benefits from doing a home visit in an overnight. Um, I like doing them. I do think they just give you that added insight. And often what you hear on the phone might not match what the emotion actually is, if that makes sense. Whereas when you're doing a home visit, you're there in the moment, you can see if they're upset, you can see if they're anxious, you can see the kind of parenting style that they do. But do I believe that it has to be done that way? No, I don't. But I think I know a lot of sleep practitioners that totally prefer <laughs> and mainly do home visits. And so I think it's an, it's an individual choice. Brilliant, thank you. And that was from Lenka, not Galaxy Tab. Sorry, oh, okay. <laughs> that's the device, so I assume. Um, just go back to Kay um, about the webinars, just a Q&A come in saying, um, are the webinars for free? So part of the course, the weekend course, um, as part of, sorry, part of the overall course, you get the weekend and then the webinars following that are free, uh, sorry, are part of the course. So you have to do the course to, to get those webinars. Um, so uh, another question from Renata is, is it possible to teach little bit, uh, little uh, big child to sleep alone out of the parents bed yeah absolutely um i mean i work with children up to the age of eight that's just my cutoff point i have worked with older but that's kind of where i am um but yes i regularly work with older children that are still co-sleeping that either the parents kind of come to me and say is there anything wrong with that or they say i've had enough of it um i've I work with children that are still being breastfed very late and parents feeling quite um, unsure how to manage that to get them out of their bed. I've just finished working with a six-year-old that was breastfeeding still all night, um, had never slept in their own bed um, and they're doing really well now. It's, it's little steps um, and how you manage the old child is involving them in that process and not being made for me. It's about not making them feel guilty that it's wrong because the first thing I always say in that situation is to say thank you. Thank you for letting me share my nights with you. Um, it's been lovely having all these cuddles, but now it's time for us to kind of move on and, and just doing it in appropriate ways and not expecting some a child that has been co-sleeping for a long time to suddenly be able to transition into their own room in their own bed because it's not going to happen like that. It is a slow steady process to build up the confidence on both sides. Does that answer the question? Oh Libby, I can't hear you, so I don't know if you can hear me. Hello, I'm Hi. back. I'm back. Myself, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that all answers it. Fantastic, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? I've got one that came in from somebody else today, so maybe okay. it's all right if I answer that. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I was asked, what happens when you work as a sleep practitioner and the advice you give doesn't work? So normally it's about spending a bit of additional time looking at what's actually not working. So that's one of the things I first asked, what is not working? <laughs> Um, because often it's kind of, well, nothing's working. Okay, well, what do you mean by that? And breaking it down to look at your plan, going through that with the client. If there's things that they haven't implemented, just looking at why they haven't been implemented and can you give a different alternative? Because that's normally what they need. They probably feel a bit stuck. They probably feel a bit embarrassed that maybe life's gone a bit crazy and they haven't been able to follow everything through so i would just revisit their plan go back through them particularly when there's been areas that have worked so you sometimes get they did work but now they don't 
or the first night they don't work. And it, it's just building up that understanding that change takes time. And none of us have habits that we've had ingrained in us. Suddenly you can turn around and go, oh, I haven't got that habit anymore. It doesn't work like that. And um, so that's the one thing I always say is at the end of the day, if it really doesn't work, you have to make a decision as a professional. Do you give that person their money back or do you just extend the support? And I, well, I have a policy now that says no money is returned unless there is a medical reason why that support has not been able to continue. But I do sometimes extend support. If I know a family have been working really, really hard on things, but they've had other things thrown in, so the child perhaps not being well or somebody's needs to do something or there's just been something else going on, but I know they've really been trying. I will often say, look, we'll just give a little bit of extra and you can have a little, another half a week or a few days just to try and move you forward in those areas. So basically you don't want any parent leaving you disappointed if at all possible. But I do know there's a sleep practitioners where they have said, look, I don't feel maybe that issue I should have taken on. Maybe I wasn't quite experienced enough for it. And then out of respect, we'll give money. But I have a contract now that says no, no refunds. Otherwise people do tend to abuse it a bit. Okay, brilliant. Is there any other, more, any other questions? I hope people have found it useful. Um, I hope you feel that you've kind of got something out of tonight. And I would say, you know, with the three of us, you know, if you've got any questions afterwards, do let us know and we will try and answer them for you. There's a private question from me and um, we'll follow that up with you. Because um, Kay did the course in January and was look, looking at doing the webinars. Okay. So that is a possibility and we'll come back to you on that one. We've got your email address and so yeah, we'll come back. Um, oh, we just had another one come through actually. Um, I am working um, night shifts with special needs children. I got one child always sleeping late. He will do little naps if five or ten minutes, then will be awake, alive, playing. Is there any method to do? Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, so he's sleeping at, in the night, is that right? Zoom night shifts, um, I've got one child always sleeping late, um, he'll do little naps for five to ten minutes, and yeah. then be awake by playing and, and alive, is there any methods that we can help with that? Okay, so often it will be to do with um, inconsistencies in terms of going to bed and when they wake up, so it's really important first of all to have a consistent bedtime within about a half hour window when you're making changes and the same in the morning, making sure that they have the sleep um, Basically, they have the opportunity to sleep for the amount of hours that is suitable for that age. So you can find that out. They, there's quite a big average, but you need to look and check that one, he's not being expected to sleep for too many hours. And also that he's not, not being expected to sleep for too le less. Um, and then with the naps, often with five, ten minute naps, there's a number of reasons for that. It's either over tiredness. Oh, bear with me. Sorry, my alarm's just gone off. Um, so they, they can be where they're overtired, but it might be they're undertired. And often sleep associations, they're not conducive to actually quality naps. However, if he's slightly older and he seems very happy on his naps and five, ten minutes suits and seems to be overall picture doing okay, it could well be he's having what he needs to have. But first of all, it's looking at the sleep routines, lead up to sleep, those sleep associations and what they mean to that child. And then just making sure they've got a consistency in terms of going to bed, wake up times. And what can often happen with children that are doing these funny cat naps is that they have what we call a catch up on night sleep. So getting up, for example, early in the morning and by eight o'clock back to going to sleep again. And that can often mean that what they're doing is splitting their sleep patterns up. So they're kind of taking it as a whole 24 hours. They might be sleeping the amount they need, but they're doing it all in the wrong way. And so sometimes you kind of have to consolidate that a little bit and change direction a little bit. So he's not having catch up sleep at the wrong time. Does that make sense? Don't know if I've explained that very well. 
if you need any clarification on that, just pop a pop a Yeah, message. I'd probably yeah. need a bit, I can't remember who the person I was, but yeah, I'd probably need a bit more information about the age and it, it kind of what's going on, but you feel free to email me, Libby's got my email address um, and I can look at that with you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, is there any other questions before we, before we go? No. If you have any questions, then please get in touch with us. Following this webinar, we will send you an email um, with our course prospectus, which gives you an overall of um, what we're offering. Um, and if you have any questions, just reply to that and we'll get back in contact with you. Um, we're also gonna, just going to launch a quick poll, three questions. If you wouldn't mind um, answering them, it just helps us um, to, to make things better for, for webinars in the future. Um, and understand why you've why you've joined us today. So um, I think that's all okay. Have you got anything else, Julie? No, just thank you for those that have joined us, and I hope you found it useful. And like I say, and anything that you feel you have we haven't answered, or you go away and think, oh, I should have answered that. Please do come back to us, whether that's about the sleep issues and challenges, or whether it's just about the course that you'd like to know a little bit more about the course. Then please come back to us, and we'll always aim to get back to you. Um, we're currently having uh, doing an offer. Um, when we launched it, it was the first 10 students got 50% off. We've already sold through them. I think we've got six left. So if it is something you're interested in, um, get in quick whilst we're offering, where we have these places available um, and you'll save 50%, which is obviously a huge saving. Um, yeah. But any other questions, let us know. But thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.